So hey, here's something y'all might like. This is how I remember how Stokes' theorem and the divergence theorem work by relating them back to the fundamental theorem of calculus. There's a very general idea in math and physics that can be expressed as such. Information about a region is often encoded into the boundary of that region somehow. We see that sort of thing when we solve differential equations with boundary conditions, and we see it again in various calculus theorems. Take the fundamental theorem of calculus. It says that you can sum up the value of a function over some 1D domain, which is to say, take the definite integral of it, and what you get can also be obtained from the antiderivative of that function evaluated at the endpoints or boundaries of that domain. So information about what's going on in here is also contained here and here. You know what? The divergence theorem says pretty much exactly the same thing, but with a different dimensionality. The left-hand side of the theorem involves the divergence of a function. That part y'all should be able to remember. It's getting integrated over some volume, some three-dimensional domain. By analogy to the fundamental theorem of calculus, the right-hand side ought to involve the antiderivative of the function, in this case the function itself, evaluated over the boundary of that domain, which in this case is a closed surface. With that in mind, you can reconstruct the whole theorem. Okay, next up we've got Stokes' theorem. That's the tricky one. But you can kind of do it by process of elimination. We have rules involving 1D domains and 3D domains, and rules involving regular derivatives and divergences, so what's left? How about a 2D domain and a curl? So the left-hand side of Stokes' theorem involves integrating a curl over some area. By analogy, the right-hand side must involve integrating up the function itself over the 1D boundary of that domain, a line integral. And there we have it. So to recap, we have the fundamental theorem of calculus, which involves a 1D domain with zero-dimensional or point boundaries. We have Stokes' theorem, which involves a 2D domain with a 1D boundary. And we have the divergence theorem, which involves a 3D domain with a 2D boundary. Now, if you really want to have some fun, there's a variant called Green's Theorem, no relation to Green's functions, that also applies to a 3D domain with a 2D boundary. But we never really use it in this class, so I'm going to let that slide. Okay, so let's close out with a bit of application. Let's see how to go back and forth between the differential and integral forms of Maxwell's equations using these theorems. For example, take Faraday's law in differential form. It involves a curl, so we probably need Stokes' theorem. Integrate both sides over some 2D domain. Use Stokes' theorem to change the left-hand side into a 1D path integral, and you're done. Just don't pull that time derivative out of the right-hand side unless you're really sure that your domain isn't changing over time. Okay, so how do you go the other way? Well, you start with the integral form of Faraday's law, then you use Stokes' theorem to transform the left-hand side. But don't just say that you can take the integral signs off and be done with it. In general, having two definite integrals be equal to one another does not require the integrands to be equal. There are a lot of different ways to take a sum and get a particular number, after all. But, if you know for sure that the two definite integrals are the same no matter what domain you choose, then, and only then, you can assume that the integrands are the same. And since Faraday's law is kind of a law of nature, you can invoke that idea here and get the differential form nice and clean.